if I was at the Eurovision, I would say, good evening, Vilnius. <laughs> Hi, Lithuania. It feels almost like the Eurovision. Um, I'm Anna Lindbergh. Thank you for having me. I feel so uh, happy and thankful to be here today, uh, share some with, something with you, and to be in Vilnius on this really awesome, amazing uh, spring day. Okay, so uh, I'm going to speak a little bit. I'm going to share some personal experience with you uh, about leading uh, in change. Um, as I said, my name is Anna. I live in the southeast of Sweden. Uh, I've been a journalist all my life, uh, working in the media business, and I've been working with um, uh, digital development very much, like in the zone between uh, tech and business and uh, publishing. So digital publishing is uh, one of my uh, core areas. And... Um, <clears throat> I really sincerely think that women are very well suited for leading uh, in change. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And as I said, you know, it's not like I'm an, an expert, like I come with all this data. I come with my person and my experience and what I've been doing under the, during the last uh, three years. Uh, and I hope that I'll give you something to to take with you and to use in, in your lives. Um, this is Ökhötta uh, Media, the company where I work. I've been the CEO for three years now. We have around 250 employees, uh, six local and regional newspapers, morning uh, or news sites, seven uh, morning papers, which are uh, subscribed. Uh, we have vertical sites, you know, sports and uh, shopping and business and stuff like that. Uh, five free newspapers, uh, and we have a reach about, of about 80% of our local market. Uh, and uh, uh, the, one of our newspapers, Norrköpings Tidningar, is actually one of the oldest in the world. It was founded, founded in uh, 1758, and uh, so 260 years old this year, which is kind of amazing. Uh, so we feed uh, this region, Östergötland and the north of Småland, with uh, press, free news and information 24-7. And we have uh, about, we reach about a half a million people. So that is the company I work for. <coughs> uh, and uh, in 1997, everything was going very well, you know. Uh, companies like mine uh, owned the distribution. Uh, we had like a monopoly when it came to uh, advertising income. And also, information was not free. It was actually quite expensive. So, a very a golden age for the media. But you know about the global digital disruption that has... Uh, you know, it all started with the internet around the, the turn of the century. And... Uh, then, you know, Mark Zuckerberg established Facebook in 2004. And 2007, Apple launched the iPhone. Uh, and people had internet in their pockets. And everything has really, really changed when it comes to the media industry in a, in a, very, in a very fast way. And uh, sometimes I think of the media as well as music business and the, the movies business, the entertainment business, as like in the, for the forefront of digitalization. And uh, what has happened has really struck very hard at our business models. And financing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the free press is not easy nowadays. Uh, we see that when it comes to digital ad advertising, the, comp the, the competition is really, really fierce. Uh, when it comes to uh, paid digital information, it's not so easy, you know, when digital information it has cost like zero during very many years. And also, you know, everybody can distribute free on the internet. Everybody is more or less a publisher in some kind of way. And uh, this, this means that the only thing that I really know is that it's not going to be 1997 again. That time is gone. It's over. And I have to some, somehow uh, adjust to that. But sometimes I also think about, you know, the newspaper that is 260 years old. 
You don't grow 260 years old if you don't have in your DNA the ability to transform. So transformation is really a part of what we do. It's really not, not uh, something that we're not, that we're not used to. But the thing is that now, uh, things, uh, the change is escalating so fast. And during the last three years, I have had to lead very um, profound and very challenging changes in the company in a very short period of time. And for me, it's very important to have my heart with me and to keep the inner me intact, even though my job requires me to, to uh, do some tough stuff now and then. You always have to bear your heart with, with you. And you know, when it comes to strategy, it's, I believe that it's not very hard to, you know, to, to have a strategy and to put it down on paper or to you know, make a PowerPoint and you speak with all your coworkers and everybody's happy. The hard part is to actually make change. And uh, when it comes to digital, you know, I've been working with digital transformation all my life and I, I've realized that people like to talk digital when they come from a legacy business like ours, but it's much harder to work and live digital. Uh, and the digital ecosystem requires of business today, whether it's a media industry or any other industry, that you are transparent and that you are close to your customers and to your audience, uh, which is new for many of us. Uh, the newsroom used to be somewhere, you know, you could sit behind your desks and set the agenda and write whatever you want. Nowadays, with social media, you always have to be in tune with your audience and you also have to, to uh, have a transparency. And also, it's interesting, uh, you know, the, the old legacy business was, you know, morning paper at 6 a.m. every morning. Now it's 24-7. In 2011, I started a news agency in Sweden. Uh, and uh, the, the business idea was to uh, uh, do news during nighttime. So the staff would work between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And we're still, we're still in business. And in order to, you know, the digital customer requires information when it happens, not a day later or three hours later. And also the digital customer experience, you have to understand that uh, we're, you're part of an ecosystem. And whatever you share and whatever you do will be scrutinized in, the di in this ecosystem. And it will be posted on Facebook and it might go viral. And if you don't know what you're doing, then you'll have all this bad will and everything. So the digital customer experience is uh, very much uh, a matter of platform and, and, uh, and um, good technical, uh, user-friendly platforms. But it's also a matter matter of, uh, of uh, being in tune with the audience. And also, uh, in my business, what we had to do was to, to lower costs and to increase profi profitability and to work with efficiency. And these things, <laughs> number five, is uh, these p uh, processes are often very painful because it involves people who have to leave their jobs. It involves people who have to change. It involves people who have to, to um, maybe move to another city or whatever. Uh, this has been my reality. So all these things you have to do, and it's easy to put it on paper. It's harder to do in real life. Uh, <clears throat> about three years ago, I was uh, uh, in the US. And I now, now I'm going to talk about some things that I've learned and some things that I think that many female leaders have skills and that we can, we can uh, be very good leaders in the digital era. I was in the US and I visited Stanford University. This is a picture of Stanford University, you know, in California. And I was visiting uh, um, an education for design. And the thing was that uh, most of the students from this uh, design uh, uh, education, they went to Google and Facebook and the other great Silicon Valley uh, companies. And they had this very interesting concept that they called empathize. As a design student, you had to empathize with the user, to really, in your heart, understand what the user experience was like. 
And they told me that in 100% of the cases, they started out with this notion, okay, now we're going to talk to the users, we're going to act like the users, we're going to try to understand the user's point of view. And in 100% of the cases, when they had uh, come a bit into the project, they started talking about, you know, uh, form and color and what they liked uh, and, and what they thought it would be best if, if it looked like. They lost the empathy along the way, you see? So it's very easy to fall back. It's very easy to, okay, I want to put myself in the place of the user, but it's very easy to fall back and to think, okay, what do I like, what do I need, what is important for me and my business? But I truly believe that being able to empathize with your customer or your audience is a key to success, because that's what it's all about. And as a woman, I think many I, and I, I don't want to generalize too much because I truly believe that there are more <laughs> differences between women than people might think. And there are more likeness between women and men than we might think. But there are still some things that we are brought up with and that are uh, into our culture. And I truly believe that empathy is something that many women are taught very early. And the ability to empathize with your, or with your audience or your customer is, is, is a key. And uh, uh, when I've been working with this, I, I, I have also experienced that this is, this is a bit ab abstract. It's much easier to empathize with the people who are, ex who are around you, your co-workers or the managers you work with. But when you truly empathize with the audience, that's when you create great content, that's when you create great products, that's when you meet the needs of your customers, and that's why they want to choose you, even in this competition, and that's why they want to come back. So being able to empathize for real, I think that is a key, and uh, I think that many women have it in them, which is great. Another thing that I've been thinking a lot about is loyalty. Where is my loyalty as a leader when I have to lead change and transformation? I have cut the costs of my business with 30% in three years, which has been very, <laughs> it has taken a lot of, of hard work and a lot of tough decisions. And where is my loyalty? Where does it belong? And it's, a bit, it's also about empathizing, because I believe that if you want to lead change for real, if you really want to transform something profoundly, you have to be loyal to the vision, to the goal, to where you are going. And that is also a bit abstract, like, hey, do I know where we're going? Do I have the goal? Well, then if you don't, then you better put it down, because that is so important if you're going to lead change. And uh, for me, it's been uh, sometimes a bit painful because I think many women are brought up uh, in, we are very good at creating teams. We are very good at listening to people and making people feel comfortable. And then when you come to a point that you have to take a decision that will actually affect these people's lives, it can be very hard and it's easy to fall back and to think that, oh, I don't want to go out on this limb. I would, I would rather, you know, be in my comfort zone, uh, feel secure. Uh, but I also believe that, and I've also experienced that, when, the, when, when you can explain the loyalty, you know, we have to go this way because it will never be 1997 again. If we don't transform, we will not survive. And when you explain that loyalty to your co-workers, eventually you'll gain trust. People will trust you and people will say, you know what, I want to go with you. I'd like to go on this journey with you. So I, and of course, as a business leader, you always are loyal to the owners of the business, of course. But sometimes it's hard, you know, you have to, you have to really think about where is, where is my loyalty, where is my heart in this. And uh, sometimes it can be very, it can really affect relationships. I've been working as a, a, a journalist in the newsroom, and I used to be, you know, a person that everybody liked. I used to be someone that, that, <laughs> that you know, everybody liked me. I'm a likable person. 
And then, <laughs> mostly, and then when I got this job, I suddenly had to make all these tough decisions, and I suddenly had to put myself in another position in order to be loyal to, to where the company is, is going. And that can be very painful, but I believe that that is truly necessary uh, if you want to lead change for real, and if you want to profoundly transform a company. Then we have the concept of risk. And um, I don't know about you, I guess that many of you in here, you were good girls in school, weren't you? No. No, okay. Many of you were, some of you weren't. Okay, I was one. I was definitely a good girl in school. I always wanted to, uh, you know, achieve the best results, and I always took responsibility, and I always did my homework, and I did my homework a little bit more than I actually had to. And uh, I was brought up that way, you know, good girl, obedient, doing whatever people are ex expecting from her. And uh, that's good. That's no, it's nothing bad with that. But the thing is that when you're brought up being a good girl, uh, the risk of failing is really uh, not something you want to do. Hmm? And when I talk about risk, it's not like, you know, just go ahead, do whatever, don't calculate the consequences. No, I'm talking about f facing the, the risk that you will actually fail. This spring, I've been uh, working with our sales department because we have to transform our sales department really uh, profoundly. And you know, transforming a sales department is taking a huge risk because if sales department don't work, income will decrease, yeah? But I, I just felt, you know, that if I'm not loyal to the vision, if I don't make these decisions, if I don't start really making an impact, we will slowly starve to death. That's the truth. We will slowly starve to death, or we have to transform. So. I started calculating the risks. Okay, if I go this way, what will happen? If I go that way, what will happen? And not only me, of course, I had a team around me and we've been talking a lot about this. And then, you know, it, ca it came to me that the thing that was holding me back was not whether the bowl is bigger or not, because I know that the bowl is bigger. What was, what was uh, uh, prohibiting me was my own fear of failing. But the thing is, without failure, you will not learn, will you? So you have to, you have to take risks and fail in order to learn something. So, uh, and, and this is also, I think, a, a gender uh, issue where many, uh, we, we raise our boys to take risks and we raise our girl not to do it. I think that there is something very powerful about female risk-taking, you know, calculating the con consequences and making the, the leap. Because it's calculated. It's not because we want to be macho. It's not because we want to win a contest. It's because we see that the bowl is bigger so that we're willing, we're willing to take the risk and take the leap. And uh, without risk-taking, there will be no change. Because in my business, there is no one who knows what the free, what, what the free press will be like in 10 years. There are lots of experts, but no one really knows. So you have to be able to, to take the leap, I believe. And my experience is that the bowl is always bigger. And sometimes you, get, you, you, you miss it, but you survive, mostly. And then one, another thing that, that I've been learning when it comes to leading uh, a big company through a transition is that uh, change for real, if you really want to make change, conflict will occur. And you know, Swedish people, we don't like conflict very much. <laughs> We're not like the French or the, the Italians who can stand and, and yell in an, in an office. We don't do that. We like consent. We like when it's, you know, steady and people are very uh, mellow. 
so conflict when it comes to Swedish business tradition is, is not very much appreciated. It's not something that we really want to do, is my experience. But I believe that, you know, leading change for real will uh, evoke conflict. It will happen. And this is also something I've been thinking a lot about. One way is to avoid conflict, so you avoid change, and you, you avoid doing all these things that, that you really have to do. Uh, or you see conflict as a possibility of connecting in a new way. And uh, for me, conflict is not, you know, like winning a contest. To me, conflict is uh, standing, being strong, this is my decision, and I, I stand for it, you know, and I have my arguments, and I'll talk to you anytime, but I will also listen to you, because maybe you have thought about something that I have not thought about. That possibility is very big. Uh, what can you give me that I have not thought about? And that is not about, you know, backing down from the, some principles that you have to stick to. It's about uh, not being prestigious, because I don't believe that you can be a leader for change if you have a lot of prestige. Because if you have a lot of prestige, you will not be a good conflict handler. You will not want to take the risks because you won't want to fail and you will definitely not empathize. So prestige is something that you just have to put aside, I think. And uh, that is also something that, uh, and, and now I'm generalizing again because there are many men who are not prestigious, but the, the, um, the ability to not be prestigious is something that is very much worth when you're going through profound changes and you have to lead, you have to lead in change. And uh, conflict is, uh, I think, something that makes us grow. Without conflict, we get nowhere even in Sweden. So this is pretty much what I wanted to share with you. Uh, the only thing I know is that you can't stand still. I mean, we have done these changes the last three years. We have come out with the reach is better than before. We are uh, increasing our digital uh, income, both from uh, uh, subscribers and from the um, advertising market and we are definitely positioning our company in this post-disruptive context, uh, which is really a fascinating and an amazing journey. And I, I believe, you know, that yes, you have to be courageous and everything, but first of all, be empathetic, use the empathy, remember the loyalty, don't be afraid of risks, because failure in itself is not is not bad and uh, do not be afraid of conflict because conflict is always a way for both you and the p and the person you're meeting to actually grow and to actually go forward that was it thank you